Welcome everyone. Feel free to go ahead and introduce yourselves in the chat as you're coming in. Welcome everyone. We'll give it another two minutes or so for people to filter in from the waiting room. Feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat. Welcome everyone. I see we got a question about closed captioning and yes, we will have closed captioning available today. Feel free to keep on introducing yourselves in the chat. We'll give it about one more minute for people to keep filtering in. I'm seeing a lot of people introducing themselves from all over the place. You've got Florida, Texas, North Carolina, Alabama, Florida, New Jersey, Virginia. We've got um, yeah, really all over the place. DC, Detroit, Kentucky, Rhode Island, Oregon, Madison, Texas, Virginia. Awesome. Too many for me to keep up with, but great to see people here from really all over the place. All right, I think everyone from the waiting room has made it in, so we can go ahead and get started. Welcome to today's Our Homes, Our Votes webinar on early voting and vote by mail. My name is Courtney Cooperman. I'm a housing advocacy organizer at NLIHC. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm really excited about our panel today. I'm featuring Bryce Bennett from Vote Early Day and Chris Wegner from Colorado Cross Disability Coalition. Um, before we get started, just a reminder that this webinar is being recorded. The resources that are shared in the chat and the recording will be sent out um, at the end of the week in our new Friday e-newsletter called The Connection. So The Connection will hit your inbox Friday afternoon and you'll be able to find all of the follow-up information in there. Um, also, again, feel free to use the Q&A throughout the webinar. We'll have plenty of time to ask our panelists questions. And I think that is all. I think that we are ready to hand it over to Bryce. Well, hello, folks. Uh, I'm so grateful for the opportunity to present a little bit about Vote Early Day and the work that we're doing. Uh, it looks like the, the slides are, are being pulled up now, but I'm Bryce Bennett. I'm the project director at Vote Early Day. Uh, it's so good to connect with you all, and I'm excited to share a little bit more with you about our civic holiday. Uh, so if you go to the, the first slide, if you go to the next one after that. So I'm sure that for many people out there, the first question that they're going to have is, what is Vote Early Day? Because I'm sure that some of you, this might be the first time that you're hearing about it. And certainly, we are so, so grateful to be partners with your incredible organization and all of the amazing partners on the ground uh, all over the country. Uh, it goes a long way to making sure that Americans have the ability to cast their ballots ahead of Election Day and are able to share that information about how to do it with others. But for folks who haven't celebrated with us before, I'll give you a quick overview of what Vote Early Day is. Uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, Vote Early Day is a nonpartisan holiday that was created in 2020 by the folks at MTV as a national day of action and celebration. This holiday is a movement of media companies, businesses, nonprofits, election administrators, and creatives working together to ensure that all Americans have the tools to vote early. And it is our goal to change the culture around voting so people think about election day as the last day to vote, not the only day to vote. And this year, if you go to the next slide, we are celebrating on Friday, October 28th, which is just under 40 days away at this point. It is always the Friday right before Halloween, right as interest in the election is spiking. Uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, this fall, our partners will be working towards three important goals. Uh, turning out 3 million voters on Vote Early Day itself, 
increasing the number of people who vote early over 2018's record and making a measurable impact by having over 500,000 voters cast ballots or take a tangible step towards casting a ballot through their work. So on the next piece, I wanna tell you just a little bit about the vote early day model and why we know that it works. So we focus this holiday on voting early because Americans so often run into barriers when they wait to vote on election day. So our solution to that, as you'll see on the next slide, is urging Americans to vote ahead of election day. And on the slide after that, you can see that it allows you to avoid long lines, hectic schedules, voter disinformation and confusion related to constantly changing election laws, which often create barriers for people to vote. You know, each of these issues unto itself could be the thing that stops somebody from casting their ballot and having their voice heard. But when people vote early, nothing can stop them from having their voice heard and their vote counted. On the next slide, you can see that Vote Early Day is a day of action where we bring together partners from all walks of life, many outside of the traditional civic space, to connect with voters where they are. And while those of us who do this work or follow the news closely will hear countless reminders to vote, there are many people out there who will not. So our solution to that is actively reaching out to people and meeting them where they are by reaching out to both people who are traditionally involved in the civic space, you know, the people who are always going to be talking about elections, as well as sports teams, social media platforms, fashion brands, mm -hmm. national food banks, and many other diverse partners who are able to meet voters where they are. And certainly we think that this group is an a uh, perfect purple example of that because I don't know that everybody immediately goes oh housing and voting is the logical connection but obviously because of the close connection that housing providers and advocates have with the people who are their renters with their owners the people who are involved with this work you have such incredible opportunity to be that voice that gives people the information and the tools they need to learn how they can vote early so as you can see on the next slide after that by bringing together thousands of amazing partners, we are able to break through the noise and meet voters where they are, no matter where they live, who they are, or how they vote. And this is just a great example for us to be able to show people that you know, you're seeing some names up there that are obviously well-known household brands, and some of them have been very, very involved in the civic space for a long time. But there's also plenty of them that have really never been involved in politics in any way, shape, or form. And this is their one day, this is their one moment where they really lean in to make sure that people have the information they need to cast a ballot. On the next slide, you can see it's also important that Voter Early Day is a day of celebration because with partisan politics, as toxic as it ever is right now, it is no surprise that many Americans are deciding to opt out of participating. So that is why Voter Early Day partners celebrate by building fun and exciting activations that invite people to cast their ballots in person, mail in their ballot or drop it off by having people cast their ballot as part of a celebration like a party at the polls, a polling place red carpet, or a concert at a ballot drop off location, we can lower the barrier for entry that keeps many people out of their democracy. And you can see on the next slide that there's a lot of fun examples of different ways that people have celebrated over the years. You know, the best part is that it is an open source holiday. You know, you get to choose what sort of celebration makes sense for you, whether that's sharing something over social media, creating an event, having educational materials at your office, wh whatever it is that you wanna do to celebrate this holiday, you know, you get to decide. And that's the exciting thing for us because just like there's no right way or wrong way to celebrate Halloween or the 4th of July, there is no one set way that people can invest in this holiday and really make it their own to ensure that the people in their community get the information they need to have their voices heard. So obviously this is a big year. Uh, and I think the question that we always have to ask when we're talking about programs like this is not just, well, it seems like it's a cool program, but why so important in 2022? Well, you'll see on the next slide, as you all know, you know, Congress, Governor's Mansion, Secretaries of State, and so many other important offices are all on the line this year. Uh, we also know that many states have changed their election laws, which will lead to many voters showing up with the wrong ID at the wrong polling place, or a number of other challenges that may befall them. That is why a holiday like a vote early day is really, really important to make sure that we can short circuit these issues. And you can see from past celebrations, 
we've had hundreds of national partners and thousands of local partners and millions of people casting their ballots on Voter Early Day as we've celebrated in 2020 and 2021. You know, the exciting thing is that we know there is a ton of momentum and excitement around voting early. We've seen it in the primaries. And a number that I like to throw out as a great way to show the statistic is that with more people or there are more people who voted early in 2020 than 2018 and 2016 combined. We know there's a ton of momentum around this idea and we know that people are eager to do it. And this is an opportunity for us to build a celebration around it. So this momentum comes from the support of incredible partners on the ground, you know, the people who are connecting with people face to face, as you can see on the next slide. We would love to work with each of you to build an exciting and meaningful celebration that is going to connect with you. So every premier or every partner that signs up to celebrate Vote Early Day will get access to a number of different tools. So you'll get the online pieces like sample social media, emails, press releases, everything you could possibly need to have a wonderful, exciting celebration. Uh, you'll also get access to our team to support you and uplift you. Uh, their grant window just closed recently. Uh, you'll also get recognition in our materials, as well as we will mail you swag so that you'll get posters and stickers and other amazing things all along the way so that your uh, celebration can be amplified even further. So on Vote Early Day, there are going to be thousands of organizations celebrating this holiday, highlighting their commitment to ensuring that every voice is heard in our democracy. And we hope that you'll be part of it as well. I see in the chat uh, that they just dropped the link where you can sign up and be part of Vote Early Day and celebrate in a way that is meaningful and impactful for the folks in your community. So I thank you for the opportunity to share a little bit more about our holiday. Uh, we're so, so grateful to have this national organization involved, and we certainly hope that there'll be an opportunity to have all the rest of you involved by signing up uh, with the link that you can see in the chat. So happy to answer any questions for folks when we get to that period. But again, thank you for the opportunity to share a little bit more. Thank you so much, Bryce. I know we are counting down the days to vote early day, although we do have a few other civic holidays coming up even before then, uh, which I'll talk about more at the end. Uh, we got one really, gr really great question from John, which is, doesn't early voting deprive you of late breaking candidate information that might change your opinion? That's a great question. And certainly, you know, I, I've seen that in, you know, my old home state where there's stuff that happens right before election day. And I, I think that, you know, certainly if that's something that is important to folks, we, we hope that you, you can lean into that option uh, as it makes sense for you. But I, I will tell you that the more pressing issue that we have seen over and over and over again is that people will wait until election day, especially those last few hours of election day, and then there's an issue with child care, or there's a last minute work problem, or there's some other issue that arises, or there's a super long line, and you got to make sure that you get back home to, you know, address the, the family need or the work need or whatever it may be. And because of that, people don't have a say at all. And we know that voting early helps people overcome these issues over and over and over again. And as I said during my presentation, there's so many states out there that have changed their election laws. So people who are going to be waiting you know, are going to be in a situation where they show up at a polling location with the wrong ID, or it's not even a polling location anymore. It's shut down and it's changed to something else. So we know that certainly your concern is a fair one, but I think that compared to the much larger issue of people losing their ability to have their voice heard in its entirety, uh, I think that it certainly is a great more, a great argument about why we should lean into voting early. Thank you. Yeah, I think that really speaks to the importance of just having so many options and being able to take advantage of whatever option is the best fit for you. Absolutely. Um, so Right. So as, as you've discussed, one of, the region, one of the reasons why we encourage early voting is because it gives the voters time to encounter any problems that come up. Um, but of course, if I were to you know, go to vote early and found that there was some issue, maybe I would feel a little bit discouraged and like, you know, is it really worth the time to try and fix that? So if a voter runs into an obstacle during the early voting period, what's your advice for making sure that they don't get discouraged and that they actually vote um, through another means. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that 
it's so important that everyone has a chance to share their voice this year. I mean, certainly that's true every year, but I think with so much on the line, we don't want anybody to miss out on the opportunity to have a chance to cast their ballot to make sure that they uh, have their say in our democracy. So, uh, you know, it can be uh, complicated sometimes. Our democracy is not always as, you know, clean and straightforward as we would all hope. But I think that by, you know, building this sense of community around, you know, events like Vote Early Day, it really is a chance for us to lean into this idea that it's not just you know, my individual responsibility, but something that we are coming together as a community to do. And I think that when you run into those roadblocks, if it feels like you're the only one out there, it might be easy enough to say, well, it's not for me, I'm not gonna engage with it. But by all of us coming together around this idea of participating, celebrating and investing in our democracy, you have that peer support that goes a long way to making sure that people feel invested. Right, yeah, the positive messaging that makes it feel exciting and as part of a community rather than frustrating, for sure. Absolutely. Um, great, John asked another really great, great question, which I, I think there's an answer to. Um, what about a be prepared to vote holiday where people are encouraged to learn or prepare to vote in person? Uh, that's a great question. So I, I would say that there there is a holiday that uh, sort of leans into that that's coming after. So tomorrow we have uh, National Voter Registration Day, which is very, very exciting. But right after that, in early October, is National Voter Education Week. And it's a week long day where they talk about learn about what's on your ballot, check your voter registration, you know, make sure that you understand the rules about how you can go about casting a ballot in your state, in your community. So I think that uh, that is, is sort of built in to do exactly what uh, you're wondering about. So I think that we've, we've got that one covered and certainly it's a great opportunity uh, to encourage more and more people to take advantage of that week. Thank you. Yes. And I'll have an announcement towards the end of the webinar about National Voter Education Week. Um, so, yes, there's definitely there's a space to kind of fill that gap between registering and showing up to vote. I'm really excited to celebrate that one, too. Absolutely. Um, one other question I wanted to ask is I know that this holiday is all about creativity. You called it an open source holiday. I'm wondering if there are any specific like exciting activities that you know about that vote early day partners have in the works oh gosh i our partners are so amazing and so creative the the things that they build each year uh completely blow my mind because I, I always think that you know we've got all these you know creative ideas that we put on our our website so that you know if people are trying to figure out something they might get some inspiration but then when people actually start putting together their events, uh, it's even more awe-inspiring. So uh, there's some really great educational events that people are doing over Zoom. Uh, I know that in Pennsylvania, there's a circus group that is doing something around a polling location that's sort of drawing people in uh, through one of those, uh, through a performance, you know, a, near the a polling location there. Uh, I know that there's a, a car parade that's being put together in Baltimore where people are going to be decorating their, their cars and, and going out to vote together. Uh, and then I know, uh, as well as in Minneapolis, I think, there's going to be a big uh, celebration on one of the campuses where I think they're going to try to pull all of the different mascots of the college and city teams together to have them all go down to a polling location and vote to encourage uh, people in the community to have their voices heard as well. So. Uh, I mean, I could go on and on and on, but there's uh, really, really amazing ways that people are celebrating the holiday. And uh, each one of them is, is going to be really impactful for their community because the folks on the ground really understand best how to connect with folks. Oh, that all sounds super fun. Um, and if people want to find an event in their community, is that something they can search for on that, that website link? Yeah, so uh, I'll give you all a little preview here. Uh, we haven't launched it yet, but later this week, Actually, we will be officially launching a new update to our website where you'll be able to see an activation map. Uh, so you'll be able to find uh, what's happening in your community, whether it's a, a national partner that has some sort of offer that they're providing or, or some sort of way that they're engaging on that day, or whether it's a local library, nonprofit, campus group that's putting together an event. So you'll be able to see a map filled with amazing stars. 
of all these amazing groups uh, highlighting what they're going to be doing in every corner of the country. Awesome. I got a comment from Claudia. Hi, Claudia. Um, that her complex in city won't necessarily allow stuff like this. So what would your recommendation be for dealing with uh, whether it's a local government or a building or a school that is resistant to doing anything to celebrate vote early day? You know, I think it, it just comes down to creativity because I, I think that, you know, we talk about celebrating voter early day. And I think when people think celebrate, they immediately think, oh, it's got to be an event, it's got to be a big party, and those are fun, and we, we really love them, but it doesn't mean that that's the only way of going about it. You know, doing something online, you know, where you gather people over Zoom, I mean, e even if celebrating for you is, I'm going to share information over social media, I'm going to do, you know, something including in the, or include something in the uh, newsletter that we're sending out to let people know about some of those options. You know, we can do something off campus, you know, or off the, the building site, you know, where we can gather people at, you know, a local ice cream shop or pizza place or uh, whatever it may be. Or maybe there's an opportunity, you know, if there is a group that's already doing something in your town where you can highlight another event that's happening in your community and send people to be part of that. And you could be co-sponsors that have it together. So I, I don't know the specific situation of why they uh, don't like fun in those communities, uh, but uh, certainly, I think that there's always creative ways for people to engage in this work. I mean, really, whatever you're able to do, whatever is meaningful and impactful for your community uh, and shares with people the information they need to vote early goes a long way, however you cut it. Thank you. Uh, we had another question from John. Um, do you have any concerns about the integrity of early voting, especially as you know it's grown a lot uh, in some places, it's relatively new. Are there any concerns there? No, no. I mean, I know that uh, the election administrators that we work with, and we're very proud of the fact that we've got an election official advisory committee that has uh, bipartisan secretaries of state, bipartisan local election officials uh, who give us you know, direct advice and information about you know, what it's actually like to run these elections, you know, whether it's people voting by mail, voting in person, dropping off their ballot, whatever it may be, you know, they're able to give us sort of the inside edge. And I can tell you that uh, universally from all four states that those folks are from, they are saying this is a safe and secure way to cast a ballot. And obviously it goes a long way to making sure that you don't run into the barriers that happen on election day. And, and the other piece of it, as well that is important to say that it's really something that has a lot of bipartisan support when it comes to election officials themselves. I mean, obviously they are working very, very long hours. You know, they are doing so much to make sure that our democracy is open and accessible and possible for, you know, all the different folks to engage with it. And by voting early, it means that they're able to process some of those ballots a little earlier. They're not having to stay up until four in the, you know, 4 a.m. in the morning the next day, continuing to count ballots. So it's something that is, is both a benefit for the voter and for the election official. And, you know, we see that as a win-win. Totally. Um, I also want to note that Misha put a comment in the chat about Missouri's voter registration laws that are really stringent, um, that you can't register more than 10 people or educate a group, um, which is really disturbing and such an obstacle. So I'm wondering, um, I guess, kind of two questions stemming from that. One, how is Vote Early Day addressing the rise in restrictive voter laws? And two, are there similar efforts to restrict early voting or is that kind of proceeding along without as much, um, you know, kind of more restrictions being enacted? Yeah, the, all great questions. So I think that, uh, we have seen, like I said before, a number of changes in election laws with uh, voter ID uh, being probably the most prevalent of some of the changes that we've seen, but also other ways that are going to affect how people cast a ballot. So, um, you know, Voter Early Day for us in so many of these situations, and the, and the reason why we lean into it is about education. You know, I think that as much as possible, giving people the information they need so that they can cast their ballot and have their voice heard. Because uh, as things change, I think that it's really incumbent upon all of us to make sure that the people who you work with, who you serve, uh, who are so integral to the communities that you're part of, uh, have the information they need to make sure that their voice is heard. And I imagine that 
you know, the sort of folks who show up on a call like this are probably going to be pretty tuned in to exactly what's happening in changing election laws and, and what you have to do or what changes might happen to ensure that you're able to cast your ballot. But there's probably a lot of people that you're you're working with, with, uh, you know, your constituencies that don't have that information and anything that we can do to get that out there uh, and get the information in their hands so they can be empowered to cast a ballot as well goes a long way. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that, Bryce. Um, we're going to pass it along to Chris now to talk about another very important voting option, which is vote by mail. Thanks, folks. Hey, Bryce. Hey, thank you, Courtney. Thanks for having us. Um, I'm excited to live in Colorado where vote by mail is the rule, not the exception. And in fact, since we adopted it in 2013, um, the figures I was able to find most recently are from 2016, 93% of Coloradans voted by mail, um, up from only 28% the year before we had passed it back in 2012. So it is a very exciting option. And at the same time, it's easy to take it for granted. If you've never lived anywhere but Colorado, you are horrified by what you hear on the news. Um, and hopefully you're horrified by what you hear on the news no matter where you live. But when we hear of things that have gone on, of course, in Georgia, Texas, Florida, you name it, um, it's, it's just unfathomable in some ways. Um, you try to have empathy, but at the same time, it's no big whoop. In Colorado, you want to vote? You vote. It's very easy. It's, um, it's a low bar to cross, and it has always been that way. We've always been supportive of access to voting. Um, in fact, Colorado was the first state to allow women to vote. The people before us um, who had allowed it were territories. So we were the first state to pass it in 1893. And basically, Colorado is all about the vote. And we're not always forward thinkers, but thank goodness we're forward thinkers in this capacity. Um, and I do want to say I've got some links that I would like to share because our Secretary of State um, office is Again, very cooperative, very supportive, no matter which party is in the office. And that is quite pleasing to us. And I believe Sid is already sharing that. All you have to do is type in Go Vote Colorado, and this is the page that appears. And from that page, you can link to virtually any question you may have about voting and specifically about mail-in voting as well. Um, this page will tell you how to register. And if you are going to be voting by mail, which of course you are, you have that option, um, you would have to send in a form of identification if it's your first registration. But all of these questions are covered here. And there is a mail-in FAQ page um, that specifically speaks to mail-in questions. And um, I guess what I'd like to say is we make it pretty simple and pretty foolproof here. So again, while we're horrified to hear what goes on elsewhere, now we have our own um, little bit of a thing in that people might just go, oh, the ballots came and toss them on the refrigerator or whatever. But for the most part, people take it pretty seriously. And we still have the option um, for persons to take their um, ballots to the ballot drop boxes. There are approximately 400 ballot drop boxes across our state. And you can take your ballot there um, and then the process to have it counted is pretty fascinating to me. So go, I'll go on about that in just a minute. But you can return it by mail. There is no official recommendation of how soon to return it, but generally about eight days before election, we'll pretty much get it there. And our Secretary of State's office is, um, very good about following up with the post office to the extent that in one year we 
uh, she actually had to sue the post office to make sure that misinformation wasn't being delivered to Colorado homes. Um, they had put out information about vote by mail and absentee ballots, and we were able to get them to stop um, spreading misinformation that does not apply to Colorado. Unfortunately, there aren't a lot of states that um, do exclusively vote by mail. As of 2022, California, Colorado, Hawaii, Nevada, Oregon, Utah, and Washington are among them. And it would be awesome to see other states head this direction. Um, since we have been doing this since 2013, our first election was just on some ballot initiatives in November of 2013. But by 2016, we were completely up to speed. As I mentioned, 93% of voters voted by mail in 2016. So that by the time the pandemic rolled around, we knew what we were doing and we had none of the issues that other um, states were facing. And we also had ironed out any concerns about, um, well, I won't say any concerns, but most major concerns about the possibility of people illegally registering or filling out others' ballots or voter fraud. And in fact, one of the former um, Homeland Security um, heads called our state the gold standard of vote by mail and so it is it's definitely a good system um the returning of the ballot i can tell you that you sign your envelope on the outside of the ballot and then you've either mailed it in or dropped it at a ballot box that signature is electronically confirmed before the ballot is before the envelope is even open. And then the envelopes, um, if they cannot be electronically confirmed, go to a bipartisan team of judges. If a first team of judges can't confirm the signature, a second team of judges will try to compare to prior year's voting records. And finally, if that doesn't catch, then you are notified by mail um, that you need to cure your ballot and your envelope is not even opened until that signature is verified. And then um, the envelope itself is electronically opened on two sides so that no one sees or touches your ballot until um, it has been judged to be accurate and valid. And so that's a great feature that whenever you hear about voting fraud and, oh, this isn't possible, we have so many double checks, you wouldn't believe it. Um, however, I am aware that my um, memory can be a little bit Swiss cheese. So that's one of the reasons um, I wanted to provide the Secretary of State links because it is so comprehensive and also because I defer to it whenever I have a member at CCDC ask a voting question, I always defer to the most current information from the Secretary of State. And if it's um, a question that the site does not answer, we have contacts within the Secretary of State office who I can contact by phone or email. Actually, any citizen could, but when I first came on, I made a point to um, make contacts within Secretary of State as well as um, personal contact with all 64 of our clerk and recorder's offices, just so that in event of a situation in a county that wasn't nearby, I would be able not to intervene, but to try to put our members in touch with um, someone with a sympathetic listening ear. And so um, I'm sorry, Sid, I neglected to mention you could move to the um, slide on text to cure. And that can show some of the steps of what might happen if you do get a notice of text to cure. And you can even preemptively um, contact the Secretary of State and go, hey, I, I seem to remember not signing my ballot, get hold of me if you need to. So you can even initiate that um, contact on your own. Um, 
And so I do have a couple more links I'd like to share, but if it's all right, I'd like to go ahead and take questions now. Um, Sydney or Courtney. Great, thank you so much, Chris. Uh, we've gotten a lot of questions. So I'm kind of trying to come through and figure out uh, even you. where where to start. Um, but one question we got is, um, if someone mails your ballot in on election day, will it be counted? And it how many days? No. Uh, that one I can guarantee it won't be. It is not by postmark. It must be received in your county's clerk and recorder by closing of polls. Um, so again, no one is willing to um, make a recommendation of when you should mail it. I've seen a soft recommendation of eight days. So in other words, mail it by Halloween. Um, or you can always drive it or have someone drive it to a ballot box. And again, we have the stipulation, no more than 10 ballots to be handled by any individual. So if you're coordinating with a neighbor or something, you've got to make sure she didn't take her nine brothers and sisters ballots already. Um, and we're also encouraging voting plans, of course. For sure. And as Bryce pointed out, um, so that would be specific for Colorado, but actually the deadline is for receiving the mail-in ballots is state dependent. So in some states it's based on postmark and some it's based on um, when it's received and some they will count them after election day and some they won't. Um, so it's very much a state by state thing. We actually, um, in our most recent edition of Tenant Talk, we have uh, a table of all of these deadlines. Um, so awesome. we can try to That's get that cool. in the chat for you. But yeah, I think Bryce also mentioned that even if the even if the deadline um, you know is based on postmark rather than received, um, it's always safe to vote early uh, or send in your mail-in ballot early. That's that can be a great way to make sure that you're not running into that problem. Um, Absolutely, that's a great, great question. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. I should have specified this is all going to be pretty Colorado centric. But thank you, Bryce, because that's absolutely the case. Thanks for that. Yeah. Um, all right. I've seen a lot of other good questions coming through. Let me pull those up. Um, so, so again, I think you've emphasized that Colorado is really one of the the gold standard states for access to vote by mail. Um, but we've gotten some comments from people who are who are not so fortunate in their states and have dealt with restrictions on vote by mail. Um, so we got a comment from. Sorry, now I'm losing it in the chat again um, from Mary. And Mary, I believe you're in Wisconsin, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but Mary said that she's concerned about the removal of dedicated voting boxes and the possibility that ballots are lost when mixed in with mail from the postal system. Do you have any suggestions for ensuring a ballot is counted given that um, for her dedicated drop boxes aren't an option? I don't have suggestions other than lobby with your legislature. I mean, certainly um, I know that our post office puts a special priority on them and I'm sorry, I don't know if it's the size of the ballot, if they have a machine that sorts that enables ballots to be pulled out along with anything else that might be exactly that size. Um, that's a good question and I need to know more about it. I don't know what to say other than then protest, activate. Um, I can tell you it took many years for us to get to the ballot system, even though we're ahead of the curb or the vote by mail system. Um, I'm sorry to hear that that's happening. Now, one suggestion that I would have, um, again, with the, the caveat that this is all different in every state, as I know at least um, I used to vote in New Jersey and we could drop off our mail-in ballots at the county clerk's office. Um, yes. So if I wanted to make sure that they got it, instead of putting it in my town's drop box or sending it in the post office, I could just bring it to the office directly, um, which may be a bit of a hassle, but if you really want to see it get received, um, again, I would always double check, but the good, there's a good chance that that is an option. That's true here as well. And I think that is probably the point is to have it in the county clerk's hands by mm -hmm. close of business or in one of their official receptacles. Mm -hmm. We got a question from Liz um, sent to the panelists that Wisconsin has early in-person voting 
two weeks before the weekend before the election, but registration ends October 19th. Can people register to vote during early in-person voting? Um, Liz, I did a quick Google search on this on when I saw your question come in because I didn't know the answer off the top of my head. And according to Rock the Vote, the answer is yes. So I'm gonna drop that link in the chat. Um, but Bryce, I don't know if you have any, if you wanna chime back in with any comments on early voting paired with um, same day voter registration. Is that something that you've worked on? Yeah, it's a, a state by state situation. Uh, so uh, you can check your local state secretary of state's office or whoever the election uh, leader is or your county election office or, or give them a call and they can give you some of those answers. But yeah, there there is no universal when it comes to election day registration or early voting or, or really any other uh, laws around voting. It is a state by state and community by community uh, situation. Yeah. Yeah, um, kind of on a similar note, I saw that Brenna asked a question about people experiencing homelessness um, and can they vote by mail? And we got a lot of follow-up questions related to that and some comments. Um, Joanna noted that a lot of shelters can have clients put their address down, but of course, not all people experiencing homelessness are in shelters. Um, so Chris, do you want to comment at all on how this works in Colorado? Um, in Colorado, two things. Let me say, as far as registering, we can register right up until voting day. Worst case scenario, you might get a provisional ballot, but um, you can register to close of the polls. As far as persons experiencing homelessness, um, to put it just very frankly, they could even isolate a park bench within a certain um, area of a, a known park, or they can say, I generally sleep in the alley behind 13th and Verbena um, by the church. And that can literally be considered to be their address in Colorado. Mm -hmm. So I would hope eventually everyone can have that happen. And I would hope nobody needs to be sleeping in the alley real soon. So. Sure. Um, and given that most voters in Colorado vote by mail, how how do people experiencing homelessness who are unsheltered coordinate getting their ballots in the mail or are they encouraged to vote in person instead? Um, they're not encouraged necessarily to vote in person. Um, as someone mentioned, there are some shelters that will allow their address to be used. There are some food banks here that will allow that or a person could um, request a ballot from the county clerk's office and then return it through whatever means, um, the box or a vote in person center or walk it into the secretary of state or whomever. So it can be done. Right. Yeah. It can always that. be improved, of course, but it can be For done. Sure. For sure, and I know um, uh, Joanna noted a lot of shelters can have clients put their address down, um, and Lisa provided some really great information uh, specific to Michigan, uh, which I'd recommend checking out. And we also, we did a webinar on this topic actually about a month ago that got into some more of the uh, specifics of registering and casting a ballot while experiencing homelessness. Uh, so I would definitely recommend checking that out, as well as some resources from U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness a National Alliance to End Homelessness um, and National Coalition for the Homeless. They've provided a lot more, um, but it's great to see everyone who's familiar with their state's specific procedure sharing all of that in the chat. I uh, really appreciate that. Um, all right, I think we got a few more questions. Let me just check. Um, John asked another really great question. Um, so John has voted in Colorado early more than once um, and hasn't seen any major issues, but nationally feels kind of bombarded with troubling news regarding mail-in or early voting procedures. Um, so Chris, how would you respond to kind of this troubling national narrative about, about vote by mail and how that might be different than your experiences? Um, I would have to say, I've recently heard a figure that it takes 25 years for social change to get a grip on anything. So start fighting early and often wherever you are. And I think everyone here is doing that within their own state. Um, I know that Colorado first put vote by mail to the ballot in 
2002, at that time, the ballot measure was defeated uh, by 57%. By the time they turned it around in 2011, I'm sorry, 2012, it was approved by 74% vote. So it takes some time. Um, hopefully COVID and people having seen success with it in 2020 can do a good thing in this instance. Um, but just put the pressure on your legislature and keep leaning in. And I wish I had more information. I wish I could clone you all because everybody's doing a great job. No, I think that's a really helpful answer in terms of something that might seem politically impossible one year can become widely accepted just a few years down the line. Um, so I think that should be at least a bit encouraging for people in states that don't yet have these um, accessible voting opportunities that if you push for it, if you show that it works in other places, that change is possible. Um, for what it's worth, and I don't know if this is what caused us to be able to adopt it, but Colorado has, I won't say copied, but walked in the footsteps of Oregon on several initiatives. One was vote by mail. Um, one was our handling of marijuana. And one is um, death with dignity or physician assisted suicide. So apparently of any of the states that I'm aware of, Oregon has figured out how to turn that key. And I will include, um, for all the research that I have done previous to this and specific to today, I found one article that's very comprehensive on the history of vote by mail. So I'm gonna have that link included. It's from Colorado and it pretty much talks about the road to get here. And hopefully people will find that helpful in their state. Um, and I'm sorry, I took you off track there, Courtney, go ahead. No, no, I was just gonna ask uh, another question that I think will be a good segue into one of the other resources you have, which is, um, so you're with the Colorado Cross Disability Coalition. Um, so why yes. is vote by mail really important for accessibility and turnout for voters with disabilities? Certainly, um, vote by mail is dramatically important for anyone who's housebound or has transportation issues. Of course, for anyone who might have compromised immune system and doesn't want to ex be exposed to hordes of people in a line or couldn't be able to stand in a line or even lean in a line or whatever. So it's certainly important um, to the disabled community. In Colorado, we also have electronic voting for those persons and um, actually anyone can use it, but they do name some specific recognized um, disability factors that might incline you to vote from home. You have to be a little bit computer savvy because if you're not registered, you would have to be able to figure out how to get your ID scanned and into the system. But that's something um, that's easily enough done if you have the time and the patience and the technology or a friend who has the technology. Um, so that can be done, but vote by mail is, is really a boon for folks who can't get out for whatever reason. For sure. Um, I think that might be a good transition. Chris, if you think this is a good time for the video. I absolutely do. This is not a production of CCDC, but one of our partner organizations. And I know many of you are also partnered with RevUp. And this is from Texas RevUp. Hopefully it'll queue up and get us all some movement and music and a little toe tapping and I hope you all enjoy it. Thank you for listening and having me here. Don't miss the vote. Music and lyrics by Meredith Gaines, a diverse group of people in colorful t-shirts push open the doors to the Texas Capitol. They carry voting rights signs, sing, dance, and pump their fist into the air.
to be heard. Say so, just shout the word. A line of dancers in front of a monument, some in wheelchairs, do a breakdance style wave. One dancer pushes their hands and energy to the next and so on. Rub up, register, educate, vote, use your power, make the disability vote count. www.revuptexas.org. Thank you so much for sharing that, Chris. Um, Chris, did we get to all of the links that you wanted to share? We did. Thank you. Awesome. Um, well, thank you so much. Um, I'm just so, so excited to just know more about your work and to um, to have you in this movement. I've been seeing a lot of appreciation for you and for CCDC in the chat. Um, so you're just doing such such incredible stuff. Um, so I'm just gonna take the, the last few minutes to share some announcements about some exciting events on the horizon. I know we spent a few, uh, a little while, you know, talking about Vote Early Day, but actually even in the 40 days between now and Vote Early Day, we have some additional civic holidays. So I will touch on those briefly. Um, first of all, tomorrow, it's coming up very quickly, is National Voter Registration Day, which you've probably heard about if you've been attending these webinars because I've certainly um, talked about it a whole bunch. This is a great opportunity to register to vote or confirm that you're registered at your current address, which you can do on vote.org. Um, so again, and even if you've registered in the past, if you've moved recently, if you've changed your name recently, um, this is a really great moment to make sure that you're registered. Let's say you know that you're registered, you just did it, or maybe you go and you register tomorrow. Don't stop there. You should check in with some of your family and friends and make sure that they're registered too. Especially if you know anyone who recently moved, recently changed their name, recently became a US citizen, or recently turned 18. Um, so I encourage you to register. You can visit vote.org to do that. I would also encourage you to look for a National Voter Registration Day event in your community. And we'll share the link to browse through the online kind of database of events that are taking place. We're also going to be joining the National Voter Registration Day movement across the country and lighting up social media. And we really hope that you'll join us too. So you can use some content from the National Voter Registration Day Toolkit and the Our Homes, Our Votes Media Toolkit. If you use the hashtags Our Homes, Our Votes 22 and hashtag Vote Ready, um, we'll keep an eye out for your tweets. We'll try to amplify as many of them as we can. And you can also tag at Our Homes Votes and we will be sure to amplify those. Um, so we'll share the link to those two toolkits, the National Voter Registration Day Toolkit and the Our Homes, Our Votes Media Toolkit. And of course, last but not least, tomorrow is a great day to reach out to your members of Congress about a bill called the Our Homes, Our Votes Act, which would facilitate voter registration for residents of federally subsidized housing. And you can send a message to your members of Congress and urge them to support, to support this bill at the link that we'll share in the chat. Also, I'm not gonna say too much about this because it's like a bit of a surprise, but we're gonna be dropping a really exciting announcement tomorrow related to National Voter Registration Day. I want to tell all of you about it right here, right now, but I'm not going to. Um, so just keep an eye out in your inbox tomorrow for an announcement about an exciting new voter registration related initiative that NLIHC and a number of our partners are doing. Um, and we'll be sharing that out on social media too. I know that is very cryptic, um, but just don't want to ruin the surprise. <laughs> <laughs> Kate, um, the next slide. 
So I know that someone asked the question in the chat and I think we addressed the question um, on the webinar about how do you prepare voters to vote? Is there a holiday for that? Are there events around that? And the answer to that question is a resounding yes. Two weeks from now will be the beginning of National Voter Education Week. And this is an entire week dedicated to making sure that voters have a plan to vote and know what to expect on their ballot. Our Homes, Our Votes is working with our partners at the Coalition on Human Needs and other organizations on two social media activations for National Voter Education Week. We'll kick off the week on Monday, October 3rd with a tweet chat where we'll answer some commonly asked questions about nonpartisan voter education and we'll close out a week with a the week with a Twitter storm uh, where we'll build even further momentum for nonpartisan voter engagement as we head closer to the election. So we're still, we're still in the planning stages on these events, but definitely mark your calendars. And if you're interested in being part of the planning process for these two social media activations, please feel free to reach out to me. My email is ccooperman at nlihc.org and Sid just dropped that in the chat. Uh, we can go to the next slide. I also wanna call your attention to something called the Nonprofit Voter Empowerment Pledge which is a nonpartisan initiative organized by independent sector and nonprofit vote. And I know we've had nonprofit vote speak on the webinar series before and are always sharing out a lot of their resources. The Nonprofit Voter Empowerment Pledge encourages nonprofit organizations to see voter engagement as an essential piece of achieving their mission and take steps to ensure that their community members can cast their ballots. If you're on this webinar today, the odds are that you're already doing everything that the Nonprofit Voter Empowerment Pledge would ask you to sign on to. So I would encourage you to learn a bit more about the pledge and sign on so you can be recognized as a partner and get access to their partner resources. Sid just shared the link where you can learn more and sign on to the pledge. And you can also feel free to reach out to me if you have questions about that. Uh, next slide. I just wanna make sure everyone is aware that Our Homes, Our Votes has a campaign store. You can order Our Homes, Our Votes swag uh, if you wanna wear it to the polling place or when you're dropping off your mail-in ballot or if you're going to a vote early day event, um, what better way to show up than wearing an Our Homes, Our Votes t-shirt or sticker or button. We have messages in both English and Spanish available in the store. So you can check it out in the Shopify link. And yes, we do have a Spanish merch too, too and it is beautiful. Um, so yes, check out the link if you want to buy some swag. So that brings us to the end. Um, on the next slide, just we have a little bit of a preview of our next webinar, which will be Monday, October 3rd. And that will be all about overcoming voter suppression. We have another all-star panel lined up with speakers from Rev Up, the Native American Rights Fund, and the Bedford County Listening Project. Um, so I'll just check and see if any questions have come in. But if not, I think that brings us to the end. Oh, I see a note from Marsh that Oregon does not mind uh, following Colorado's footsteps. Yes, we love sharing good ideas. Um, but yeah, thank you all for being here today. Thank you for the enthusiasm. And I hope to see you online tomorrow for National Voter Registration Day and back on the webinar on October 3rd. Thanks, everyone. All right, thanks everyone, bye.